The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. Slightly less voice this morning than normal, but we're here and we're getting it done, right? Sorry that we're coming to you a little bit late, but that's okay. We got a big, big show for you planned this morning. We're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. This is the home for Autism Live. It is also the home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And uh, can I just take one second to say that... Um, I know that we talk a little bit about CARD here on the show, um, and CARD gives us the space to do the show. They are the underwriters for the show. But I want to say, for my part, that I would be here talking about CARD even if that weren't true. Um, I, I think that they are the best ABA provider in the world. Um, that's my opinion, and I like to be forthcoming with you about that. But that is my opinion from firsthand knowledge from having my son have five years of therapy at CARD, and that is why I am such a big cheerleader about CARD and what happens at CARD, because if you haven't heard this from me before, let me say this during the holiday season, I got my child back because of CARD. And I know I'm not the only one. I know that there are more and more of us that have that to say and are so grateful, and I don't think there's a mom that I've heard say that, and believe me, I've heard hundreds of moms say that, I got my child back because of CARD. We, none of us can say it without a crack in our voice, right? And a tear in our eye because it's no small thing. In fact, it's the biggest thing in the world. But that is why I come in here. That is why I take the time to sit and talk with you guys and why I bring up CARD. I know that some of you are in places where you can't get CARD, and I know that there are other great ABA providers that are out there. Uh, but I will say, if you have the choice, get card. But there are other ABA providers out there, and it is why I'm such a champion for you getting um, good ABA services in your life. If you have a loved one who is on the autism spectrum, whether they are an infant or a senior citizen, I know that ABA can help you to get to the things that you want and that they want. And that is why I encourage you. That's why we are here at CARD. Um, more than that they gave us the space. I just wanted to be clear about that. Somebody asked me about that the other day, and I was like, I don't even mean to make sure I tell people. In any case, uh, we are, we're going to be with you live for the next two hours, and Gabe has started to already show you some of the different ways that you can connect with us. I do want to remind you that our homepage is still autism-live.com, but we do have a new website in beta. We were just showing it to you. It is that HTTP. There it is, right? See, Gabe is so good. HTTP colon backslash backslash beta.autism-live.com. Uh, now, in both of those sites, you have access to being able to talk to us. It's different in both sites. So if you're on the old site, there is the computer screen. Click on the triangle. On the computer sc screen, it starts the live show or the most recently recorded live show playing. To the side of all that is the live feature. Put your cursor in the box that says your question and type and hit enter. It shows up here on my screen. Now, on the beta site, on the new fancy schmancy site, um, there are all these little blocks that you can choose. What video do you want to watch? And when we're live, at the top of the screen, it will, uh, there's a red light. If you click on, it, it'll say live. If you click on that, it'll full screen the live show and you can see a little bit better the things that we do here. Um, but you still want to talk to us, right? So at the bottom, there's a little button that says chat. If you click that, it opens up and you can type and hit enter and then you and I could be having a conversation. So all that is true. But there are lots of other ways that you can watch the show. There's lots, and Gabe will show you some of those. Lots of other ways that you can connect 
connect with us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Periscope, you know, you name it. We have our own Roku channel. Um, lots of different ways that you can connect with us. We try to make ourselves available wherever people will look. Um, and we're free on all of those things. We're a free download on iTunes. I want you to know that costs us money. And we, but we want you to have it. We want you to have the information and share the information because I believe and know that there's somebody out there that needs it. And sometimes you need it at 2 o'clock in the morning where you are, and we don't want to be just available during this period of time, right? We're down to the last three shows of the, the year. So we've got a big show for you planned today. I do uh, like to start our Thursday mornings with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. Uh, this is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out just what in the hey nani nani are these people, these experts talking about. So today's jargon term, I kind of changed it because um, I had a phone call with mom yesterday and I thought oh gosh you know even though we have Bonnie on the show there's still so much that we need to cycle back over because parents you know you tend to there's so much going on you listen to what's happening in the moment and you do what you need to do in the moment and you hear other things I remember when people were talking about the teen years when my son was three and I was like yeah I'm not there we'll talk about the teen thing when I get there and then you blink and you're there right so uh, every year more parents go off to school and more parents have problems and I forget that we need to cycle through some of the education terms more on a regular basis. So today's a jargon term that we're going to cycle back through is IEP. And I know we talk about this a lot on the show. We throw terms around and anytime there's something that we say on the show that you don't understand, please, you know, take me to task and say, remember, for those of us that are new, you got to explain what these are. So um, the jargon uh, day, IEP, what does IEP stand for? IEP stands for Individualized Education Program or Plan. In some states they say plan and some they say program. doesn't really matter, but it's an Individualized Education Program or Plan. Um, okay, and so that's what it actually translates to. That's the actual definition of it. But our working definition for IEP is that it is a legal document that says what education services your child is going to get for the next school year, for the next year. Because sometimes you sign an IEP in March. And that will be until the following March, right? Sometimes you sign it in October. It's for the next year. And there are lots of different parts to an IEP, right? Um, and, but at some point, you, you know, there are goals that they have for the individual, what it is we're working on. What do we have a reasonable expectation that we're going to make it to this point? And then you get to the page that says services, right? There's a lot of other stuff in an IEP, but for a parent that's just starting out, I really think that those are the two things you got to focus on. <coughs> Excuse me. So goals and services. And because these are the two things that parents, well, and placement. Let's say that. You got to, and that should be in the services page. So um, sometimes you get an IEP and the goals are ridiculous. They're never, I've yet to see the IEP where the goals are so lofty that the parent is sitting there going, really, we can get there? I haven't seen that IEP. Maybe they exist. I, I guess that could happen, but I haven't seen it. And please know that I'm a former teacher and that I love good, talented teachers. Absolutely do and I have nothing bad to say about them. But there are some administrators mm, that I have other things to say about. Because when people start looking at education as a monetary issue. I have a problem with that, right? I know that there's a reality, but I have a problem with that. And there is a federal law that says you can't do that with a child who has any kind of a documented disability. You can't say we can't provide this because we don't have enough dollars. Sorry, federal law dictates that. So you have this IEP and, and it is your federal document that says how the education is going to be individualized for your child. And I keep going back to that individualized because a lot of times schools have so they're so overrun right now with kids who have IEPs 
that it is not unusual for a, a district to have two to 4,000 IEPs in their district. And so what happens is some well-meaning person at the district level says, we're not going to be able to do all of these. We're, we have to find a way to streamline this process. So, you know, because uh, we can't think this through for this many people. So they'll try to put in place some things to make it easier because it's a lot of paperwork. And sometimes they'll have good ideas that are of value. Uh, but a lot of times what that streamlining does is it takes out the individualized. Well, that's the first word in the acronym, right? So it's incumbent upon us as parents to make sure that we keep saying mm -mm, individualized, mm -mm, individualized. And uh, the other thing about the IEP that you need to know is that it must legally give you what we call FAPE, a free, appropriate public education. So at some point in your IEP, it, the, the school or the district will outline for you what their offer of FAPE is. That's usually what you're seeing on your services page. So you've got your goals. Um, a lot of times the goals are too easy. Keep in mind that the reason why they're doing it is that way is because they're responsible for whatever that is. So if they say that by the end of you know, by this and so date, which is a year from the IEP, that Billy will know all of his colors and be able to speak them and understand them, um, then they have to do that. They have to figure out a way to teach that to him and they're responsible for it. And if they can't teach it to him, they have to be able to show that they tried their best. So a lot of times schools will put in goals that they already know that they can achieve. And sometimes that means putting in goals that the child already can meet. We have to be diligent as parents to make sure that the goals are substantive, absolutely substantive. And then on the services page, that's usually where we have the biggest arguments, although sometimes big arguments are on the goals page too. Um, that's where it's determined which classroom your child's going to be in. Uh, and I don't mean which teacher, but I mean what level of classroom. Are they going to be in a special day class? Are they attending their home school? Are they going to be mainstreamed for part of the day? Are they going to be in a resource room? Where are they going to be? Who's providing the instruction? Who's responsible for the IEP and meeting the goals in the IEP? How are they going to document it? Um, do they get extra services? Is there a one-on-one -on -one aid? Um, are they there all of the hours that the child is in school or just during direct instruction? These are all things that we want to look for and understand. Do they get speech? Do they get OT? Do they get uh, adaptive phys physical education, APE? Um, all these different things will be outlined on the services page and it won't give you the names of the person who is providing it as much as the title of the person who will be providing it. It won't tell you the methods that they plan on using generally. Although I have seen parents that have been able to write in that they want um, ABA services uh, or, and it won't tell you, it will tell you the person's title, but it won't necessarily, <clears throat> excuse me, tell you the level of their training. So it might say that there is a paraprofessional who will be with a one-on-one -on -one aid, but you won't know how much training or experience they have. You have the right to ask and you have the right to say, I am concerned that this person be trained in X, Y, and Z, right? And you can write that into the IEP. And I used to think, what's the point of doing that? But now I understand that that's a really good thing to do because if something happens a year later, you can refer back to that and say, no, I brought this up a year and a half ago and it's a public record because it's a legal document. Um, so all of these things are important. And it's the reason why IEP meetings get very, very stressful because if it isn't in the document, it's almost as though it doesn't exist from a legal standpoint. And when you have a really good IEP, by the way, there's another element to it that if your child has uh, behavior issues, challenging behavior, you definitely want to get a BIP, which is a behavior intervention plan. And there's a part on the first page of the IEP that says BIP attached and you want to see that check that it is attached. When a BIP is attached to an IEP, it is part of the legal document too. 
And this is where we can save lives. And I don't mean to get melodramatic about it, but if your child has challenging behavior or there is a concern about challenging behavior and there is no BIP attached and somebody does something stupid, like they pinch the child's ears, which we've covered that story, right? Uh, the substitute teacher who pinched the child's ears as a form of punishment. If it's not, you know, I mean, you can still get a lawyer and you can still argue that it's abuse, but if it's not, it, what makes it super easy, if it's written into the BIP and the BIP is attached to the IEP, if anything that is not written on the BIP is, is out of compliance, and legally, those are the magic words. You're out of compliance with the school. So look over your IEP, know where your IEP is. I suggest getting a sheet protector that has a magnet on the back and sticking it to the side of your refrigerator so you know where it is at all times. Um, and making copies of it for everybody who's on your child's team, including anybody who interacts with your child, the bus driver, the lunch lady, you know what I'm saying? But we have to be experts in this as parents first and foremost. So IEP, individualized education plan or program, that's what it is. And if you get that document right, it's the roadmap to success for that year. You can get a lot done in a year with a good IEP and a decent teacher. Man, stuff will happen. It'll be really good stuff. Okay, so that's our jargon of the day. We always have a question. <laughs> For you a question of the day and I like to have you guys dream from time to time so my question for you today is if if money were not an issue if there were nothing stopping you what would be your ideal gift if somebody could just say to you I have this thing for you what would it be what would it be I would love it if you would write in on Facebook um, and YouTube and tell us what would your ideal gift be no holds barred I'm I'm looking I'm doing research for a reason so please write in and tell us what your ideal gift would be uh, and then we always have a topic of the day and our topic of the week for this week is making progress making progress because this is the time of year when a lot of stuff gets thrown out the window. It's the last two weeks of the year. I'm not going to start the diet now, right? Because I'm going to start the diet on January 1st. It's the last two weeks of the year, so we should cancel therapy. It's the last, you know, it's the holidays, so we should cancel therapy. It's, you know, I'm not going to start this new project now because... Of whatever so we've got a little bit of time in today's show because unfortunately we don't have Bonnie Yates today so I'm gonna take this on for you and for me because I need to hear this as well and you know what they say that you know the way to really learn something is to teach it so we're gonna take on this whole idea of making progress this morning and how we can get so much done in the last two weeks of this year that it'll make our heads spin okay we're really gonna take that on but we got a big, big show for you this morning. I'm really excited because in just a few minutes, we've got Candace Pogi is going to be with us. She's your expert of the day. Um, she's been working at CARD for a really long time. I can remember meeting Candace. She's a wonderful, wonderful <clears throat> person and a practitioner. So she's going to be answering some of your questions. She's got a new role at CARD that I didn't even know about, so I can't wait for her to tell us about that. Then we're going to have some time during the show that we're going to talk about making progress. And then um, in the second hour, we've got an autism dad that I know that you guys are going to love. He works in the radio industry locally here, but he uh, wrote a song for his son that's very special and moving. And so we're going to talk with him. Anytime we can talk to a dad, wasn't it great yesterday? Did you guys get to see the interview with Kurt and Anna uh, Wagner about the Wagner boys? Oh my gosh, if you didn't get to see that, I hope... You'll go back and look at it. We're a little bit behind on putting up our highlight videos. <laughs> We're a little bit behind on everything. We had our sensitive Santa on Saturday, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. But, um... You know, we're, we're trying to get to the end of the year, too, and we've had so much going on. Good stuff, though. Uh, we're not laying around uh, waiting for things to come. We've been making things happen, moving and shaking. Anyway, I'm late. we got to take a break, and then we're going to be back with Candace Pogie answering your questions, so stick with us. Hey, I'm Candace Cameron Bray. Tom Bergeron. You're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. You're watching Autism Live. Hi, I just 
decided to start Autism Works Now as a small business because 90% of individuals with autism and related disabilities are not employed after graduating from high school. Our mission at Autism Works Now is to create job opportunities for Spectrum youth and kids through awareness and education. to Autism Live. We regularly on the show like to feature autism experts. And today we have, I have, I don't want to get rid of this water bottle. We don't, we're not advertising them. Um, we have with us Candice Pogi. And uh, Candice is an amazing, amazing practitioner. And Candice, how many years have you been with CARD? Uh, 10 years. 10 years. That's a long time. And you recently just changed roles. You had been a, a regional manager. And now tell us what your new role at CARD is. Um, I moved into a clinical manager role. So I'm just going to be overseeing uh, one center and working closely with that team. Uh, that's fabulous. And which center are you going to be overseeing? Um, I'm still figuring that out. Right now I'm, I'm up in Oregon, and so I'm helping a lot of our new supervisors um, get going. But Okay. To be, de to be determined. All right. I, I have a preference, uh, <laughs> so I'm sure you do too, but let's compare notes later. I, I have a okay. particular center that I would like <laughs> for you to be at, but um, <laughs> for very specific reasons. But anyway, um, so Candace, we had some questions for you, and I, I swear I have them here. I had them a second ago, and then I don't know what I did with them. Um, uh, yeah. You have the questions too, though, right? Yes. I, apparently, I didn't pick up the piece of paper I thought I did, but I don't have the questions in front of me. So I'm going to ask you to read the questions because I am ill prepared. I have the wrong pieces of paper. <laughs> so, what was no the first worries. question I sent you? Um, <clears throat> the first question was Is it too late to start a child on ABA if they are nine and nonverbal? Okay. Um, and I think it's never too late to start ABA. Um, there's always something, um, usually multiple things, that we can help individuals and their families with. Um, how old the individual is and where their needs are will, will dictate the type of ABA program that they receive. For a nine-year-old that is nonverbal, we'd most likely be looking at a focus program for them that will focus on developing a functional communication system, independence in day-to-day -day life skills, um, this would likely include leisure and play skills, any missing feeding and toileting skills, um, and social skills to start, along with um, addressing any behavioral concerns. Um, all this is individualized and dependent on the needs of the child or individual. However, um, to answer your question, it's never too late to yeah. start baby. <clears throat> there are a lot of people who will tell uh, parents th these really like definitive things, like, oh, your child is too high functioning for ABA to be worth your time. Uh, and that just makes me break out into hives. And they'll say, oh, your child is too young, or your child is too old, or your child is too social, or and there are all these things that people pull out of nowhere that have no, uh, no truth to them, no relevance. Uh, it's amazing to me that, uh, and, and of course, parents, we, we're, these are experts, or so we believe, and we end up listening to them. And it isn't until later that a parent will find out, oh my gosh, my nine-year-old could have been having ABA therapy and they could have been helped with all the things that they needed to be helped with. So I love that this parent actually reached out and asked this question. And I love your answer. It's never too late. It's never too late. Look, <clears throat> if there were funding for it, ABA would help me, right? I mean, this is the truth, right? If there, if there were funding, uh, uh, that I could get ABA therapy it would help me so that I would have had, they would have worked on the executive function skills that I needed to have to have the right piece of paper here on the desk and then my life would have been improved. 
and my exactly. the product that I would have turned out would have been improved and it would have been better for me. ABA is the most it's the most efficient, most effective teaching tool there is. That's not coming from me. Studies have proven that. So there is no age at which ABA is no longer useful to you, to you and there is no ability at which ABA is no longer useful to you. So when people start saying to you things like, oh, your child is too fill in the blank for ABA, I think they're saying, I don't think you, that somebody wants to pay for that. And I would let your funding source decide that. And then I wouldn't let your funding source decide that. I would tell your funding source that your child <laughs> needs it. Right, Candace? Anyway. That's right. So uh, what was the second question we had? OK. Um, oh. Sorry, I lost it. One second. Got distracted. Um, the second question was, um, I am waiting to start services with CARD. I have completed all my paperwork, and now I ju I'm just waiting to start. What can I do with this time to be productive? I am 26, and I will be the client. Um, well, welcome. It's very exciting to have you joining our adult program. Um, well, it shouldn't take very long for you to get started at your local center. In the interim, I would recommend coming up or trying to come up with a list of priorities that um, you would like to discuss at your intake appointment. Um, write down any areas of need that you have as well as your areas of strength. All of this will be very helpful during your initial meeting with the intake clinician. Um, also, if you're looking to really get ahead, you could um, start the very thorough <laughs> assessment on Skills for Life. Um, you should have received a login for skills when you receive your intake appointment. Um, and if you can't find it in your email, um, you can reach out to skillsbook help at centerforautism.com and they can find it for you. Um, while the wait should not be long, if you are feeling that you cannot wait for services, um, maybe you're having anxiety or emotional self-control issues, um, I would recommend reaching out to your primary physician and getting a referral to like a counselor that can provide you some support in the interim. Wonderful. And I do want to say, because time is relative to everybody, um, I, time and money, I think, are the two things that are relative to everybody. I remember uh, when I was young and just out of college and I was living in New York City and I went to a doctor and who gave me a prescription and, um, and I said, oh, how much is this going to cost? Because I had no insurance. And he said, oh, it's, it's like super cheap. Because I, I said, can you fill it generically? Oh, it's super cheap. Then I went to the pharmacy, and it was $75. <clears throat> and to me, as a new student, I mean, that's still a lot of money to me for a prescription, right? But it, it, it was, I couldn't get it. I couldn't order it. And I, I went back to the doctor, and I said, what do you mean $75 isn't much? Um, and when we say things like time, you know, it, won't, it shouldn't take too long. In the realm of things, Candace is absolutely right. It won't take very long to get started. But when you're sitting in the middle of it, sometimes right. it could be a month. In extreme cases where there's funding issues, it could be as much as three months to get started. CARD tries really hard for it to never be that. But that three months can feel like an eternity if that happens to you. Right. So, you know, I love that you gave some advice for what to do in the meantime, especially if they're having anxiety. And I absolutely love if you are an adult taking that skills living uh, assessment, and if you are a parent of a child who's waiting to start, make you have to get the skills assessment done before they will start you. And it's something that takes a great deal of time and you have to pace yourself, right. but it's really productive, well-spent time. <clears throat> okay, Candace, important. what's the third question? Um, the third one is, my youngest child screams in the car. I have three children, two with ASD. I feel so bad for the one who isn't. It's never about her. What can I do to stop the screaming? So there are a few things to think about in this situation. Um, if you are receiving services, I would absolutely consult with your case supervisor on this issue. This is something they can help you with. Um, they can help you develop a reinforcement system and an intervention for your children that are struggling with being mm -hmm. in the car. If you are not in services yet, um, I would recommend trying to identify the why. Why is your child screaming in the car? Do they want your attention? Do they want specific music? Do they want to continue engaging in what they were doing prior to getting in the car? Um, do they only want you to go down specific streets? Do they struggle with transitions in general to where getting in the car is an uncertainty for them and causes them to be upset? Um, there are lots of reasons that this could be, which is why it's kind of hard to make a recommendation without <laughs> seeing the situation firsthand. Um, but 
my initial thought would be to develop an activity schedule for the child in question um, that would outline the flow of transition surrounding the car. For example, having a picture of whichever activity they were doing prior to needing to leave. Um, there may be a picture of shoes and jacket, um, then a picture of the car, and then a picture of where you were going to. And having this available to the child throughout all of these transitions so they can see it. Um, another idea would be to develop a reinforcement system for appropriate behavior in the car. Uh, this could get tricky if there is only one parent and three children in the car while also needing to implement the reinforcement system, uh, which is why I would recommend consulting with your BCBA if you have one. Um, but identifying a reinforcer that is strong enough uh, to in for your child to inhibit screaming during the car ride. Um, that ideally you could deliver at your destination. Um, you might have to give constant reminders initially um, and probably spend an afternoon or two just practicing this with short two to three minute drives that you can control and stop, get out of the car and provide the reinforcement to the child so they understand what the contingency is. Um, lastly, in regards to your child that is not on the autism spectrum, I would look at having a special reinforcement system in place just for her that rewards her for being patient and understanding with her siblings. Um, that way she's getting um, attention from you and is not left out. I would also encourage have, having her be a part of picking out the reinforcer um, so that way you know it's something that she really would like. Um, and also, um, I would try to plan a special activity for you to do uh, with her, uh, maybe once a week or once every other week. I know schedules are usually maxed for our parents. Um, but that way, it's something that just you and her are doing, and she gets to have all of your attention. Um, doing something like that will help her feel special, even though you have to divert your attention to her siblings a lot of the time. All great advice, Candace. Is It's one of the reasons why I was excited to have you on the show. I know you have good answers. So thank you so much for all that you do at CARD, and congratulations on your new role, and we'll look forward to hearing which center gets lucky enough to have you. <laughs> So, Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Well, believe me, we're, we'll ha we're going to be asking you to come back. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you so much, Candace. Happy holidays. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Um, so that was Candace Pogge. Um, wonderful, wonderful practitioner. Um, we're so lucky to have her at CARD. Okay, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to take on this idea of how do we make progress. Um, I've got a video that's coming out a little bit later on today that I want to talk with you guys about, so stick with us. Do you provide care services to someone with autism? Recently, more and more children are being diagnosed with the condition and getting the support they need as awareness grows. But what happens to these children as they grow up? It's estimated that over half a million youth with autism will turn 18 in the next decade, and they'll be faced with a very difficult reality. As children with autism grow up, their services start to disappear or become very difficult to access. Things like medical care, mental health counseling, vocational training, and more. All services that are still desperately needed. The loss of support that youth with autism face as they grow up is so severe that it's referred to in the autism community as falling off a cliff. Adults with autism need the same level of support they had as children to avoid falling off the services cliff. Introducing Skills Living, the web-based software designed specifically to help transitioning youth and adults with autism so they can avoid the cliff and instead fly to success. With Skills Living, help your learner with autism develop the skills they need in all the critical areas of adult life, including self-control, planning, and problem solving. Effective communication, performing life skill tasks for independent living, acquiring and maintaining employment or other meaningful activities, developing and maintaining social skills and relationships, accessing transportation and public services, and being safe. Skills Living includes a comprehensive assessment, a data collection mobile app, behavior intervention plan builder, and automatic progress reporting. It also provides a complete curriculum addressing 16 key areas spanning the entire range of functioning adulthood. Skills Living is easy to use and can be implemented by schools, parents, and autism service providers. Call or click today for your free demo and see how Skills Living can help your learner with autism avoid the cliff and instead reach their fullest potential. Skills Living. Wish. Learn. Become. Parent 
to parent, token economies are a great way to get to good behavior with your child. So first of all, let's talk about what is a token economy. It's just a visual representation of reinforcement or a reward that's going to come later on for behavior that you've done now. So I've got a couple examples here of uh, token economies that I want to show you. But one of the most important things to remember with a token economy is that it's essential that whatever the child is working for be meaningful to them. So here, this is a two-part token economy. I've got a list of things for the child to pick from, to pick what they want to work for. So the child would pick off the one they want, put it on their other token economy, and you can see it says, I'm working for a play date. What a great thing to work for. And as this child progresses through their day at school, every time they do a task and they do a good job, they're going to get a token to put on this token economy. And we've got a rule in place for them that says maybe you have to get three tokens in order to get that reward, which today is a play date. And as the child gets better, we're going to make it harder and harder. Maybe next week it's going to be four tokens to get the play date. This is another token economy here. This is a task completion token economy, so every time the child completes a task that there's a picture of, they can peel off a token and put it on to demonstrate that they have completed that task. Again, it's essential that they get a really wonderful, meaningful reward for having gotten these tokens. Using a token economy can be much simpler than this, too, because you can download them to put a free app on any one of your devices. Right here on my phone, I've got a free app, Easy Kid Tokens. And when my child does a task and completes it, and I, he can specify what the stickers are. In this case, it is a ladybug. And when he gets three of them, then he's going to get his reward. This is a really simple way to take something with you when you're going on an outing and make sure that your child is staying on task and getting rewarded for the things that they do. It leads to good behavior. One of the most frightening things there is is when your child wanders away or elopes. Welcome back to Autism Live. And um, you saw there a video, and Gabe was just asking me how long ago we made that video. So that video is like four and a half years old. Um, yesterday I made a new video. We haven't been making so many of those parent to parents, but I made a video that is a parent to parent, although without all the, you know, exciting graphics in the beginning. Um, because it's super duper important to me that we get the word out this holiday season. It's come to my attention that I keep talking to parents and I keep hearing them say the same thing over and over and over again about, well, we're just going to cancel therapy because. We're going to cancel therapy because we need some family time. We're going to cancel therapy because I've got holiday parties to go to, or we're going to cancel therapy because we have to go shopping, or we're going to cancel therapy because I'm just overwhelmed. And, you know, I totally, totally understand that thinking. I totally get it. I don't ever want to make it sound like it's like, what? Why would you think that, right? No, I totally get it. It's just that it's like, your thinking is completely upside down, it makes total sense unless you know some other things. And then once you see it from the other side, you can never go back. It's sort of like the FedEx truck with the, the arrow. I, you know, people used to talk about the FedEx truck arrow, and I would say, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. And they said, look at the FedEx logo. Have you ever seen that in the white space of the FedEx logo, it has an arrow? And I was like, what are you talking about? There's no arrow in the FedEx logo. And then once you see it and somebody points it out and shows you exactly where the arrow is, you can never go back. You always see the arrow, right? So I want you to see the arrow about canceling therapy, all right? So you're thinking to yourself, I'm so busy. I have so much to do. And I, believe me, we have a video that's coming out um, about this. But hopefully you'll find it amusing. But you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to cancel sessions because it'll be easier. And, and not only will you have more time to do things, but you won't have to pay the copay. So you'll save money, right? Um, and, and you're sitting there saying to yourself, all of these things are true, except mm, the first one isn't so true. If you cancel therapy and you don't have the therapist come, that's progress that your child didn't make. And that is probably one of the most important things going on in your life right now, especially if you have a child who's on the autism spectrum and doing ABA therapy. 
you have given over such a large porter portion of your life and said, we're going to do this thing and it's going to up upend our lives and it's, it's going to be crazy around here for a couple of years, but we're going to do this because we want our child to make progress. And my point is to you, if you're going to do that, then let's do it all the way. Let's not do it halfway, right? Um, and sometimes parents will say, it's just one session. And whenever I hear that, I, I tell them the story of the mom who called me very upset last fall. She had twin boys that were starting therapy. And she was so upset because it was like the second week of therapy and she took the twin boys to a center and they both had scheduled with different therapists. And so she arrived at the center. Everybody was really excited. It was a Saturday morning and they were going to do, you know, like two sessions. So they were, they were going to get like four and a half hours worth of therapy. And the first twin gets there and his therapist is there and they're excited to see each other. They're revved and they start to do therapy. Uh, the other twin, the therapist wasn't there. Uh, it started out the therapist had car trouble and was delayed and couldn't get there. And eventually the car trouble was so significant that she had to cancel the session and they couldn't find a fill-in. All of that took like 20 minutes to sort of sort out to see if they could get a fill-in and they couldn't. So she had to turn to the second twin. These are small boys on the autism spectrum. And he wants to do what his brother is doing. And she says, we got to go home. This breaks my heart, right? I just like, we, and believe me, Card has been trying to do things so that that can never happen to another kiddo. But she says, we got to go home. Now he throws a tantrum. I want to stay, right? I, I want to stay. I want to learn, right? And she says, we got to go. So she takes him and goes home and everybody's upset. Everyone's upset, right? Except the first twin is at therapy and he's getting a therapy session. And over the course of the session, they work on colors. It's one of the things in his program. And he masters the color blue. And once you master something, right, in, in all likelihood, you have it the rest of your life. So the concept of blue, this little boy now completely, he gets, he knows what blue is. He can say that it's blue. Uh, he gets the concept of blue. And they work on eye contact. And they work on a whole bunch of other things. And when it's time to pick him up to go home, mom comes and picks him up. And he's excited. He's had a great day. He played in between learning things. And he's proud. He's happy to say to her, blue. And he knows the color blue. And mom is over the moon that one of her children has made all this progress in essentially one day, two sessions. Um, <clears throat> the other child doesn't know blue. Right? And you think, well, that's okay. He'll go the next time and he'll know blue. It took five sessions before he knew the term blue. So when we say one, because part of it was that, you know, he didn't get the therapy. So he's just, he's like running to have to catch up. And the mom was saying to me, is he going to be behind the rest of his life? And the rest of us don't, a lot of us don't have twins to compare. But I want you to remember this story because one session your child could learn something huge that they have with them for the rest of their lives. So if we're saying to ourselves, I want this holiday season for my child to make the most progress that we can, what can I do to ensure that my child makes the most progress? Don't cancel sessions. I know that other things come up and you go, I want some family time. Great. I'm a huge advocate of spending family time. In fact, I think it's essential that you spend family time. But don't make the mistake of scheduling family time instead of therapy. Do it as part of therapy. So my message to you this holiday season is whatever you're doing, do it with a therapist. So what that means is that you got to think a little bit ahead, a little bit ahead, and call your whoever your provider is and say we want to do this and um, there are special rules for community outings when you're just going out into the community but the truth of the matter is is that your child has a program which means that they've got a set of lessons that they are specific to them that are very different from another kid on the autism spectrum but there's a set of lessons that the therapists know that they do with your child at this moment in time until they master them and get more and w the progression is that we try to do this in a controlled environment, maybe in a DTT setting where we've taken everything else out of the, out of the picture, and we're just working on this little thing.
then, after we've done that, we try to take this lesson and create Do you provide care services to someone with autism? Recently, more and more children are being diagnosed with the condition and getting the support they need as awareness grows. But what happens to these children as they grow up? It's estimated that over half a million youth with autism will turn 18 in the next decade, and they'll be faced with a very difficult reality. As children with autism grow up, their services start to disappear or become very difficult to access. Things like medical care, mental health counseling, vocational training, and more. All services that are still desperately needed. The loss of support that youth with autism face as they grow up is so severe that it's referred to in the autism community as falling I'm, off I'm the here, I'm watching Adults skills with living. autism need the same level of support they had as children to avoid falling off the services cliff. Introducing Skills Living the web-based software designed specifically to help transitioning youth and adults with autism so they can avoid the cliff and instead fly to success. With Skills Living, help your learner with autism develop the skills they need in all the critical areas of adult life, including self-control, planning, and problem solving, effective communication, performing life skill tasks for independent living, acquiring and maintaining employment or other meaningful activities, developing and maintaining social skills and relationships, accessing transportation and public services, and being safe. Skills Living includes a comprehensive assessment, a data collection mobile app, behavior intervention plan builder, and automatic progress reporting. It also provides a complete curriculum addressing 16 key areas spanning the entire range of functioning adulthood. Skills Living is easy to use and can be implemented by schools, parents, and autism service providers. Call or click today for your free demo and see how Skills Living can help your learner with autism avoid the cliff and instead reach their fullest potential. Skills Living. Wish. Learn. Become. Hey, welcome back. So we had a mic issue. That's why we went away abruptly. And if you were watching and you couldn't hear me, that would be why. Um, so what I was saying basically is that whatever you need to do this holiday season, you can do it with a therapist and it actually, whatever you have to do will be better for having the therapist there. A lot of people will write in and say, well, but you have to have insurance funding for community outings. It's true that if you're just going out into the community to be in the community, you have to have insurance funding for it. But I'm making the case that whatever it is that you're teaching a child, uh, at some point, you need to be able to transfer that into the environment, right? So you don't need to get pre-approval for community outings, and I'm not an insurance expert, let me say that. But for instance, if you're working on eye contact and you're working on eye contact at home, or you're working on it on the sidewalk, or you're working at a Target, or you're working at the, in line at the post office, these are all places that you need to work on eye contact. So when you're canceling therapy because you need to go uh, to the post office, you're missing an opportunity. Um, I was saying that many families will say to me, I need family time. But then let's play this out. So you have family time and you schedule it and you cancel therapy and you have family time and you've got five kids in your family and one of them is on the spectrum and you sit down to play board games, which I love as family, right? And your child who's on the spectrum gets bored. 
doesn't really know how to play the game and you're trying to address them. Now two of the other kids are fighting. Somebody gets frustrated and before you know it, the whole thing falls apart on you, right? Well, let's rerun this exact same scenario and not cancel therapy. Instead, call your ABA provider and say, hey, can we have the therapist uh, come to our house? Uh, we're going to have a family game afternoon, and we'd like the, for the therapist to be here. Now, your child probably has programs that are in, uh, lessons that are in their program that will lend itself well to working on board games. Now, for some kids, this might be a lesson in winning and losing, right? For other kids, it might be a lesson in taking turns. For other kids, it might be a lesson in cooperative play. Um, or it could be dealing with sensory issues or answering WH questions. I mean, the list is endless. Pretty much anything that you have in a program can be worked on while playing a board game. Uh, honestly, honestly, smart therapists can do this, right? So now you sit down to play the board game and you've got the therapist with you. So the therapist is, is not only dealing with your child, but is also helping the family to cope so that when your child bobbles with the with the rule or something and the therapist is helping them to figure that out and Joey kicks uh, you know them and says you, you didn't do it right then the therapist can be saying let's try that again and why don't you tell Joey what he needs to do to do it right and we'll we'll use our words you're working in conjunction with the therapist but the therapist is not only teaching your child they're teaching the whole family how to make it inclusive with a child who's on the autism spectrum. For those of you who have uh, dads in the family that are working really hard and sometimes aren't as involved in the ABA, and so they're, you know what I'm saying, that sometimes they don't follow through in the way that we would like them to do that, there's no better time than through game time because then the therap therapist can say, hey dad, can you ask him the question and, and ask him in this way? And then dad does and the child responds and dad goes, look, we were able to do that. Now dad learned something <clears throat> and the whole family is having fun you're actually getting to do the thing that you wanted to do which is to spend family time but you're really getting it done because everybody is including the person on the spectrum and nobody's having a meltdown so in that session your child makes progress the whole family makes progress do you see where I'm coming from when it used to be that it was much more common that we did things like this, that when I think back over the therapy that we had, if we hadn't gone to the grocery store, oh my gosh, that was one of the big places where my son tantrumed was the grocery store. And don't kid yourself, it got to the point where I didn't want to go grocery shopping. Now back then, we did not have all these wonderful services. If we did, believe me, I became agoraphobic. I would have been agoraphobic sooner, but I had to get food, right? Um, but it was terrible. I used to go at two o'clock in the morning to the one grocery store that was open 24 hours a day because my husband would be home with my son and that was the only time I could shop in peace. And then the therapist started going with us to the grocery store. Now, I would be lying if I said to you, it's all hearts and flowers and roses, right? Because sometimes the therapist will ask you to do something and you feel like, oh man, I just feel like, you know, I gotta have this young person explaining to me in public how to parent my child. I get it. Man, it used to upset me too and it wasn't my favorite thing, but can I tell you what it got us? I can go anywhere with my son, absolutely anywhere. And I don't have to worry about his behavior. I have not worried about how he would behave in like a decade. Isn't that crazy? And it, there was a time when I thought, I'm never gonna be able to go anywhere ever again. But that happened because I was willing to take a therapist with me and I was willing to be uncomfortable sometimes as I was learning what my child needed. We have to forgive ourselves for not knowing everything and we got to use the best resources we have. And that <laughs> absolutely is this core of therapists that surround our kids. So I'm advocating for you that if we truly want to make progress, just think of it this way. When it, when it rolls around and the ball drops and it's 2019, what do you want to say about these last two and a half weeks of the year? Do you want to look back and go, man, we made a lot of progress in these last two and a half weeks? Or do you want to look at it and be like, oh man, we got to get back on track. Which one do you choose? 
right? Because the truth is, is that you have the decision right now. It's not about January 1st, it's about right now. I remember a long time ago, I was at a conference and somebody was describing to me about how, you know, life is not like this. Life is like this, you know? <laughs> that we have ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. And they said the secret to success is that <clears throat> when you are on an up track, you know, enjoy that, but when, when things start to level off and you see that things are going down, try as desperately as you can to, if nothing else, maintain then. Because what happens is you've gone up and you come down a little bit and you maintain and then you go up from here and then you maintain here and then you go up from there. So the trend still is going up. Otherwise, you're just doing this spinning your wheels. Please don't do that with your child's well-being. Please prioritize therapy. Take a therapist with you. Do all the things that you want to do this holiday season. If you, I love to watch the Hallmark movies, right? And they always in the list, they have the, the list of all the things that the family wants to do. Oh, we want to go to the Christmas tree lot. Oh, we want to go have hot chocolate at this and so restaurant. Oh, we want to go to this holiday event. Do everything on your list. Don't cut a single thing out. Just take a therapist with you. Do therapy at that event and you will have them, your child will make progress, your family will make progress, and it will last because not only will that have made a difference for this holiday, but it'll make a difference for every holiday that you have with your child after this. Maybe you don't get it all, maybe next year you still have to take a therapist for most of those things, but you won't have to do it forever. And maybe you won't have to take them for half the things next year. Maybe your child will be able to go to the mall and stand in line and be okay and not have a meltdown. And I tell you, that's worth everything. It really is. I can go anywhere, do anything. I can hop on a plane with my son. He is better than my husband uh, to take and travel, right? Um, so all because we took a therapist with us. So make that progress. Take a therapist with you, don't cancel. Don't cancel. And the other thing I wanna say, cause I think that nobody ever speaks up for the poor therapists. <clears throat> think about who your therapists are and what their motivation is. You know, it doesn't pay that well to do therapy, not in comparison to other things. Um, you know, they have friends who work at Starbucks that they get off and they never think about their clients at Starbucks. They go out with their friends and they're not thinking about the well-being of the, the woman in line who gets the latte, right? <clears throat> but therapists, they mentally take our kids home with them. They think about how am I going to get that child to do this? How am I going to get them to do that? They're really amazing people, right? <clears throat> and we want to keep the good ones forever on our kids' teams. But stop and consider from the therapist's point of view when the holidays roll around. They have their schedule. They've made themselves available for this set of time thinking that they're gonna go and work with kiddos and they're gonna make progress. And that they're gonna get paid for it. And I don't know about you, but I, I would imagine that those therapists have plans for that money. <clears throat> especially over the holidays, right? Things that they need to spend it on, tuition, gifts for their friends and family and loved ones. Um, so they go to do their therapy and the therapy sessions get canceled. And that can be so frustrating because then the kids start to regress. It's true, if they don't have the regular amount of therapy, they will start to re regress. And not only that, the therapist makes less money. The therapist doesn't get paid if they don't do therapy, even if it's you canceling it. Now, most ABA providers will try to find a, another family to, that needs therapy, but you know, last minute especially, that can't be done. So we make the therapist's checks smaller. And I gotta say, in retrospect, that's a really gritchy thing to do. Please don't cancel on your therapist. It's not good for your kiddos and it's not good for your therapist. <clears throat> Let's all get in the holiday mode. Do the holiday events with the therapist. Make sure they get their full paycheck and that your child gets their full, pay full, check full paycheck, which is making progress. It'll be a paycheck for you too. All right, that's have a happy holiday. That's my thing about making progress with that. I don't know what time it is. Everything is a, a miss, but oh, I know what time it is. So here's the deal. We have this fabulous guest who's gonna be joining us in just a few minutes, Mark Schaefer. Um, and he is an amazing dad. 
uh, works in the field of radio, and he wrote a song for his son. So we're going to be talking with him about what it's like being a dad and why he wrote the song and why you should be checking the song out. That's all coming up in a few minutes uh, after these messages. Stick with us. Parent to parent, you might be asking yourself, how on earth can I afford ABA therapy for my child? Well, the short answer is you can't. No one can. It's really expensive and it's overwhelming to most families. But the story doesn't end there, fortunately. The first thing that I want you to think about is tapping insurance resources. So many insurance companies are paying for ABA therapy right now. So that's your first best bet. Make sure and see if your insurance company is providing benefits for ABA therapy and check back often. Now, if you see that you don't have insurance right now for ABA, don't panic. There are still other resources. The next place to go is to your local support groups and ask them what local resources there are. That's a great place to ask for information because often states and even counties have support for ABA. And then beyond that, you might consider applying for grants. There are many fabulous grants out there to help you to get support for your ABA therapy. But most important, it's, it's absolutely essential that you get ABA services for your child. We know that that's essential for all of our children and that you won't be able to do it on your own. So seek out those services and support groups that will help you to fund your ABA journey. It's really important to remember that all behaviors happen for a reason. For the month of September, I figured I'd show you guys how to make a task completion chart to help your kids get through the hardest parts of the day. Parents have been writing into our host, Shannon Penrod, the hardest parts of the day are waking up in the morning, after school, and getting ready for bed. Please keep in mind you can always modify the task completion chart to focus on the skills that your family needs most. The template we'll be using today to make the task completion chart you can find at facebook.com slash autism live. All right, let's get to it. The materials you'll be needing are the template, cardstock, scissors, hole puncher, glue, pipe cleaner, Velcro, and photos or images. We find it more reinforcing for kids if you use images of themselves doing the tasks that you're trying to get them to complete. So what I have here to start off are photos of myself doing all the tasks that we're going to add to our task completion chart today. The first step you're going to be doing is printing the template from facebook.com slash autism live. I have it here and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to trim at the top. We don't need that, that's just totally excess. Now that I trim my three templates, I'm going to label each one with a different part of the day that we're focusing on, such as waking up, after school, and getting ready for bed. Now that I've finished labeling the templates with the appropriate time of the day, I'm going to attach the photos that go with it. For bedtime, the tasks I chose were getting ready for school, putting away toys, putting on pajamas, and brushing teeth. Now I repeat this for all the rest of the day. Now that I've added the photos to the template, I am taking this along with my heavy cardstock to hold all my tokens. I'm going to line them up and make three hole punches. I'm going to take this pipe cleaner and attach the pages together with it. We're almost done putting this together. Next, I'm going to take my Velcro. I'm going to put them underneath each picture and then I'm gonna add four on the very edge too. Now that I've attached the rough side of the Velcro to the template, now I'm gonna take the softer side and add these to the tokens. You can use whatever you want for the tokens, whatever your child finds reinforcing. They could be stickers, images, spacemen, Pokemon, whatever they like. Before you use your task completion chart, it's really important that you do a preference assessment to see what your child finds reinforcing that day. Once you have that established, then you can tell them the rule for how this task completion chart works. So every time they get one of their tasks completed, they add a token to it. 
And the way the task completion chart functions is like a token economy. So after they put a token under each one of these tasks, they can trade it in for their reinforcer for the day. Now that you've made your task completion chart, hopefully your child will be able to use it on a daily basis and help them through those difficult times of the day. Well, until next time, craft on. Bye guys. Can you see me flying by your side? You say hi, do we say hi. Let's get wild, let's get wild. Let's get, let's get, 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 let's get wild. Hi, welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Lisa Ackerman. I've got Kristen Selby Gonzalez here with me today. And the feedback, overwhelmingly, oh, chicken nuggets! Probably one of the easiest recipes on the planet. Oh, we know all of our kids love <laughs> chicken nuggets. Oh, let's talk about corn. GMOs, uh, genetically modified foods, are no bueno for a lot of folks, and we agree. So um, I've actually called the manufacturers to make sure these are GMO-free product. Really simply, what I did with the, um, the cornflakes is just the old-fashioned crush away. Um, that's just the easiest way. Maybe you can crush that a little well, bit for me. our kids can help us with yeah. too, doing cooking with them. Well, and fine motor yeah, improvement. Absolutely. Boom, the sensory <laughs> issues, boom. A lot of people will over-season. Uh, they season for adults. So from the standpoint of just putting it in enough flavor, now that we got our... Uh, base or coating and I'm going to work on how we coat the chicken. Now, Kristen, was Jax ever allergic to eggs? He has been. There's a lot of options with eggs. Don't you know that you can also look at duck eggs, really? quail eggs, and other types of eggs that even though they look the same in the bowl, they're different on the allergy panel. Let's say you find out you're allergic to every egg on the planet. You can use a little bit of water and arrowroot starch. I've got a, a high-grade stainless steel, non-Teflon frying pan. I'm using high heat oil, getting all ready to go. So we're just really easily going in and coating the chicken. Now, when I'm flipping these, Lisa, um, do I flip over and over, or do I just cook one side and then the other? You know, I prefer the cook one side, because what happens is the good coating that you spent all this time crushing oh. for me falls off. Gotcha. Bonus. About how long um, do you cook on each side? About four minutes on each side. Okay. We'll do it. And okay. I think you're almost there. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're I'm golden. Good. Fantastic. So if you want to take them out. So now that we got the last batch in, let me take you through what these finished babies look like. Like I said, you're going to have some happy families um, out there wanting to eat this. This is so easy. You saw how quickly we got in and done. Just want to remind everyone, we really want feedback at Autism Live and want to know what you want to see next. So if you've got an idea, a recipe you want us to convert um, or to talk about a particular topic, we'd love to hear from you. You could do that at autismlive at gmail.com or Facebook land. We're all on Facebook, facebook.com slash autismlive. And then again, there's already thousands of recipes waiting for your eyeballs to go cruise over on the TACA website. We'll look forward to seeing you next time on Autism Live. Thanks for joining us. Inclusion is everything. Feeling like we have a place where we belong, and when I say we, I'm first and foremost a mother, a mother of a child on the spectrum and not, and gym owner and now founder of carrying this to families who need it as well. My son is extremely hyperactive. Getting him to calm down is a very difficult task. So the idea of Rock the Spectrum Gym where he could just go and run and play and do all these fun things without any kind of worries and just go, go, go and bring down that energy. It just it helps us so much at home. You know, in the home or at school, it's not acceptable, but this is the one place it is acceptable for the child to kind of be themselves and get it all out there and just really just be their, themselves. It's an amazing place where my son could go and be himself. Um, you get to meet other parents who are in the same journey as you are. I think the most popular aspect of it is how they include all children of all types. Not just all only learning disabled, 
lower functioning, moderate functioning, high functioning, and non, uh, non disabled. People there are so friendly, everybody's like family, they always greet you with a smile. There's not one negative thing I could say about any of the employees, they're all absolutely amazing. I think every parent should walk in through those doors and see what an amazing gym it is. Now a diagnosis being one out of six kids are in some way or form affected with sensory processing disorder or autism. That's why We Rock Now is on the rise. People want to be a part of it. People know that they have a community there. They know that they can learn more information about things that they don't know themselves or that they can share, build friendships, and uh, basically get what you get in an OT facility, but it's not $150 an hour. It's 12 Parent to parent, you might be asking yourself, how on earth can I afford ABA therapy for my child? Well, the short answer is you can't. No one can. It's really expensive and it's overwhelming to most families. But the story doesn't end there, fortunately. The first thing that I want you to think about is tapping insurance resources. So many insurance companies are paying for ABA therapy right now. So that's your first best bet. Make sure and see if your insurance company is providing benefits for ABA therapy and check back often. Now if you see that you don't have insurance right now for ABA, don't panic, there are still other resources. The next place to go is to your local support groups and ask them what local resources there are. That's a great place to ask for information because often states and even counties have support for ABA. And then beyond that, you might consider applying for grants. There are many fabulous grants out there to help you to get support for your ABA therapy. But most important, it's, it's absolutely essential that you get ABA services for your child. We know that that's essential for all of our children and that you won't be able to do it on your own. So seek out those services and support groups that will help you to fund your ABA journey. It's really important to remember that all behaviors happen for a reason. Welcome back to Autism Live. If you watch the show at all, you know that there are certain things that I just love. I love autism moms. I, I love communing with autism moms and connecting with them. But I got to be honest that getting the opportunity to talk to an autism dad and an awesome autism dad is something that I will always walk on hot glass to do because I don't know, there's something particularly really thrilling and exciting for me when we have a dad who's willing to talk about the empowerment and, and some of the tough stuff that comes with being an autism dad. It just, I don't know, it's thrilling to me and I think it's important for everyone in the autism community here. It's a voice we don't get to hear often enough. So I'm thrilled, so excited, that we've got one of those awesome autism dads with us right now, joining us via Skype. Mark Schaefer is with us. And Mark, you're, look at all the equipment you've got there. You're putting my studio to shame here. Tell, tell our audience where you're Skyping from. Well, actually, um, Shannon, I work at K-Wave 107.9, and it's a radio state station in Southern California, uh, but today I'm calling you from Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside oh. because they were, I have a meeting out here and so it just worked out. I called them up and said, I have to do this important Skype and you hook me up. And so I've got Shay outside the booth here who just hooked me all up and, and we're good. Well, I, and I thought you were at the radio station. I truly thought that's where you were. They've got a nice setup there. Well, I don't know if you know or have heard of Pastor Greg Laurie, but he is a very popular evangelist and does the Harvest Crusades, um, does them in Dallas, Texas. He always does it here in Orange County. And so he's got a great setup. He does a lot of radio work. Well, look at that. I'm impressed. Uh, so, Mark, I, I like, where do we start? You are an awesome 
uh, person in the community, you're, you're well known, you are someone who's always getting it done, and in addition to that, you're an autism dad. Let's start with talking about how that came to be. How did you find out that your son was on the autism spectrum? Well, it's, it's a great story. We found out back in 2003 when my son Justice was three years old. And, um, you know, he wasn't hitting his milestones. And whenever I would talk to people, they'd say, oh, he's a boy and boys are just a little bit late. We went and took him in for, you know, all of his routine medical and um, the doctors didn't say anything. And so I was just like, nope, he'll talk when he talks. And, you know, I don't know why he's not making eye contact or tiptoe walking. I'm not worried about it. And um, one day I went outside and we had a neighbor across the street who was just two weeks younger than my son. And I walked out to go to the store, and, and this little boy said to me, he goes, hi, Mark. And I said, hi, Dutchie. And he goes, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the grocery store. And he said, oh, my mommy goes to Safeway. And I go, well, that's where I'm going. And then I got in my car and you know, said goodbye, got in my car, and I drove away. And I'm like, wow, justice can say milk, please. Yeah. There might be something wrong here. And my wife had had that inclination before, but we just didn't know where to go or where to turn. And so um, luckily I was working with uh, one of my sales reps. I was a sales manager at the time. And one of my sales reps' sister uh, did floor time for autistic children. And so I started talking with her, and she said, let me have my sister come over and just spend some time with your son, and she'll be able to tell you what's up. And so we had her sister come over, and she spent like 20 minutes with my son, and she said, yes, he's autistic. And my world just started crashing around me honest and I think you know of course I can't know but based on the things that I've heard over the years I think this is harder for the dads what do you think Mark do you agree with that it, it I don't know if it was harder it was different because when I found out that my son was autistic I had of course all these questions well what does that mean what's his life gonna look like am I ever gonna you know, have my star athlete that I wanted, or my this, or my that, you know, is he going to go to high school, is he going to graduate, will he have all of the, the things that I had growing up, and, um, and I hit this low so quick, I sunk into the worst depression I've ever had in my life, I'm not a depressed person, usually very happy, uh, but this just hit me so rock solid, whereas my wife, when she found out, she said, oh my gosh, good, finally, I have a diagnosis, I can get to work, I can figure this out, I can help him. Before now, I just thought maybe I was crazy because no one else saw it. So yeah. I hit my rock bottom right away. Um, and she hit hers about eight months later when we were um, at a, a clinic back in Philadelphia area. We were at the Family Hope Center and we started getting all this information and it was just overwhelming to her. And that's when she hit her low she had a panic attack. We had to call an emergency, you know, uh, uh, ambulance to come and take her from the freeway um, to the hospital. But back at Family Hope Center, I was like, okay, great. You mean we can work hard and help him? Hey, I, I'll work hard. Yeah. I, I wonder if that's like a part of it that, uh, you know, that everybody plays their role in this and that for different partners, and because I, I don't want to generalize, that the story that you're telling is a very similar story that a lot of parents report. It's very similar to our story. I was like, you know, we got the diagnosis, now we can kick it into high gear. Well, my husband was like, what? And then right when I tripped and fell, my husband was like, no, we can do this. But I, but, and, I, and I know that sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes, you know, the, the mom is in the what phase and the dad starts out in motion. But I wonder if that's one of the hallmarks of the families that make it through is that right when, when one person is like, I, I got to sit down for a minute, I can't take this, it's when the other one picks up the charge and says, I'll, I'll carry the load for this period of time um, until the other person can come back in. Because, man, I've heard that story so often, and it's typically from the couples who have survived. And you know the statistics. A lot of people don't. What do yes. you think has been the secret of you and your wife making it through? Um, well, I've already expressed to you I uh, work at a Christian radio station. My faith in God has helped me so much through this. Um, I see the good in it. 
Uh, looking back now, my son is 18. We got him diagnosed when he was three. So we've been going at this for a long time. But looking back, I see the plan of God in it. And that plan is I've met so many people I would have never met. I've been able to help so many people I would have never been able to help. And, you know, I look at my son. I love him. I wouldn't trade him for the world. Um, you know, that being said, is, is he still quirky? He's, he's very high functioning now. When we first got him diagnosed, he was low functioning. Uh, it was low functioning slash moderate. And now, you know, he's, he's high functioning. He's a senior in high school. He's going to graduate on time. Uh, we're blessed. So a big part of that was our mutual faith, um, a lot of prayer, a lot of friends praying. Uh, but other than that, really just working together. When your wife says, you know, we need to spend $14,000 on this hyperbaric oxygen chamber, you look at her sideways and you go, is this going to help our son? Yes, then let's do it. Well, and you know, we're going to able to be that way. <clears throat> we're going to talk about some of the different things, choices that you guys made. Um, that helped you to get where you are um, and how you got to that place from being so depressed to being totally in faith and acceptance. We're going to talk about all that, but first we're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back to continue the story with this amazing autism dad. Stick with us. Hey, I'm Candace Cameron Bray. I'm Tom Bergeron. You're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. And you're watching Autism Live. You're watching Autism Live. If you're watching Autism Live, chances are you care about the life of someone or perhaps many people living with autism. You spend countless hours trying to make a better life for them. It may not have been easy for you to watch the show today. You know, sometimes you could be juggling so many balls in the air, you feel like a circus performer. I remember recently saying to a friend that as the mother of a son with autism, plus all the other challenges in my life, I feel like I'm carrying a tray full of glasses of water, and that if one of them topples over, the whole thing is going to go crashing down. This empowerment moment is all about you. Now, I'm not a doctor or a therapist, but over the last nine years in my autism journey, I've learned some things that have helped me shift from being a victim to having hope. See, I've been in that place, down on the kitchen floor, on my knees, praying for answers of what happened to my child. I've been in that place covered with blood and tears after one of Wyatt's giant tantrums where I said, where has my fairy tale life gone? I have a feeling you're a member of that kitchen floor club too. It's been a process but I've come from that place of being a victim to becoming an advocate for my son Wyatt and for many others as the executive director of ACT Today or Autism Care and Treatment Today. Let's start with reframing the way you think about yourself and your child. I want you to say after me, I'm an activist. That's right. I'm an activist because just by watching this program, you are taking positive steps to make the world a better place for your child or someone else living with autism. You are a positive force of action in the world. I want you to start thinking of your so-called disability as an opportunity because it's within our challenges that our greatness is revealed. That's where we find our courage and resiliency. And parenting a child with autism is one of the greatest challenges a parent can face. You have the choice to see this as a journey of self-discovery. Some people take expeditions to climb Mount Everest to see what they're made of. You don't have to travel that far because parenting a child with autism is an expedition of the soul. Until next time, stay strong and keep the faith. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're talking with a very special autism dad. Mark Schaefer is here with us. Uh, and he was telling us about his son being diagnosed. 
and about it taking him to a place of depression, which is not his normal, but that he was able to get to a place where he was filled with faith. faith. And I really want you to uh, tell us, lead us, Mark, because I know that there are people who are watching in this holiday season and they're still in the depression pl place. How did you get from point A to point B? Well, first of all, it took time. You know, I had to really, I, I had to grieve the loss of my son. I had to grieve the loss of something. And so I was very hurt. And there was a lot of questions. And, and one of the things that was so significant that I remember is the blame game where I would blame my wife that it was because of something in her past and she would blame me because there was something in my family line. And, and we went back and forth with that for probably like six or seven months. Like, well, it, it wasn't because of me. It must've been because of you. And, yeah. you know, and, and that is just such a dead trail. That is, don't even go down that trail. Um, because the reason your son or daughter is autistic is because your son or daughter is autistic. We, yeah. We don't have the answer for that, but what you do have is your same beautiful child. I remember going to see our doctor, and he said, look, this therapy will help your son, but know this. When you walk out of here, you have the same son, so <laughs> he's, he's not going to totally change, and so you have the child that you have. God has given you that child, and now you've just got to figure him out, and that's what I always say about my son, Justice, is he's my enigma. He's my big question mark. How do I figure him out? And that's one of those things that it's actually been, become kind of fun for me, um, but it wasn't at first. So you asked, how did I come out of it? It took time and it took a little bit of hope. And it was interesting because at the time where we lived, we had some neighbors across the street whose son was diagnosed recently with autism. So they put us in touch with their friends and their friends told us about a clinic back in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. It's called the Family Hope Center. And um, you know what? That bit of hope really helped. We were on a plane within the next few months and we went out there and that's when my wife, like I said, that's when she kind of crashed and hit her depression. But when I got out there, I was like, okay, we can do this, 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 we can help him. Because my biggest question when my son was diagnosed is what's he gonna look like when he's a teenager? Yeah. And everyone said, we don't know. Yeah. And I said, well, you have to know there's other autistic kids but, you know, one of the best quotes is when you've met an autistic kid, you've met one autistic kid. They're so different. And that's why certain therapies will work on some and certain won't on others. And I always like to say, you know, we've gone the full gamut. A through F worked. They were awesome. But you know what? G through Y didn't work. And we spent a lot of money, but they didn't work. And I still haven't discovered what Z is. So <laughs> that's why we say it that way. I love that. So let's talk about some of the things that worked for you guys. Uh, so what did you do that was helpful? Well, the first thing we did was we found out about the uh, CFGF diet or GFCF. Yeah. Gluten-free, casein-free diet. And, you know, some people were singing its praises and other people were saying that doesn't work. <clears throat> well, we decided to give it a try and we got some really good coaching on that. Um, and we found that out through Dan, by the way, Defeat Autism Now is another organization that helped us greatly at the beginning. We found a Dan doctor um, and we got some coaching on that. My wife was so rigorous. I mean, we had two toasters in the house so there wouldn't be con, you know, any, uh, oh, what do you call it? The cross-contamination. Cross-contamination, yeah. Cross <clears throat> We had a set of pans that we would cook in that were gluten casein free and a set of pans that weren't. So we took it to the extreme. My wife back then, things weren't labeled and my wife would call the companies and say, is there any chance there's any gluten in this? And so the first thing we did was we took them off of dairy. And I remember out being out front with the neighbor playing, um, and this was like maybe three or four days after. And he said, hey, Mark, did you put justice on a new medication or something? I'm all, no. I go, why? And he said, well, he just seems clear. He seems really present, uh, not typical for him. And I go, you know what? All we did was take him off the of milk. Yeah. And I thought, wow, there really is something to this. Because when you first hear about diet, you think, well, how can that have anything to do with his autism? Right. And we saw huge changes. So my wife decided, let's take him off of gluten. And when she did, uh, he didn't eat for two days. He was uh, like a opiate act addict coming off of heroin. Yeah. His eyes were just black is how she described them. 
And then after two days, that kid ate anything we put in front of him. And we put vegetables in front of him. He'd eat them. We put whatever. Before that, all he wanted was pizza, goldfish crackers, you know, anything that had the gluten and the casein in it yeah. because he was getting that opiate high from it. And so um, that really helped him. Uh, so the GFCF diet, I've always said, was the best thing we ever did for him. Um, but actually, I've kind of amended that because the best thing we ever did was had a little brother. Um, because his little brother, Jordan, will not let him just walk away. <laughs> yeah. He's in his face. But the gluten-free, casein-free diet is the first therapy-driven thing that we did that was great for him. And how much is the age difference between the boys? Five and a half years. Okay. Because a lot of people, you know, it's that thing about right about when their child is getting diagnosed, they're considering having another child. And many people... Mm -hmm back away from it and say, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is going to be a great thing. Yeah. I, and yet I hear from so many parents who went ahead and had the second child that it's one of the best things that they did for their child. Oh, talk we about why, that why that is. Thing. Oh, <clears throat> we went through the same thing. It took me that long to talk my wife into having another child um, because we were so, you know, she was just terrified we'd have another autistic child and, and we loved our son justice but you know another one that's so much work yeah. and we knew families that had a few yeah and so she took all these precautions ahead of time you know anything that had any trace of mercury in it uh like her contact solution she stopped using underarm and a purse she went and found a healthier one uh she she went gluten-free casein free for a year before you know she conceived uh so she took all these precautions and we don't know if any of those helped or not, to be honest, but it sure made her feel good about it. And when our son was born, um, uh, he's typical and neurotypical. And, you know, he had some speech delays and stuff too, but not on the spectrum. Yeah. And, and man, I'm telling you, he is the best thing that we ever did for my older son. I love that. And for anybody who's listening to the prep that his wife did and thinking, oh, that might sound a little like, mm, I don't know, We've featured many times here on the show Dr. David Berger. Uh, there is a study, it's called the P2I study, that talks specifically about can you reduce uh, a mom's risk of having a, another child with autism through controlling environment, and they have found that you absolutely can. Yeah. Uh, the, the studies are, are very clear that doing just exactly the things that your wife was doing, and depending on... <clears throat> excuse me, what is, what's going on in the mom's uh, immune system and what's going on in their environment, there are other specific things they can do specific to the person that they can reduce greatly the risk of having another child with autism. Yeah. So I, I think that what your wife did was ahead of her time uh, and, and yeah. she was definitely on to something. So uh, you mentioned the GFCF diet was really helpful to you guys. What else did you guys do and, and your son? But what else was really useful for your son and the progress that he made? Well, I've already mentioned the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. I think I have that um, down as number two of, of what we did for him. We saw great improvements as his gut began to heal. So um, the GFCF diet, when he was eating gluten, his stomach was just torn up. He had a lot of yeast. Uh, so we did the um, hyperbaric chamber. And well, first we did a round with uh, uh, a medicine called Diflucan to kill off the yeast. And man, when we did that, we had the worst yeast die off that our doctor had ever seen. Uh, but that did great things for him. His stomach was just ripped to shreds. So the hyperbaric oxygen chamber helped it heal his stomach. That with the new diet, we saw a lot of great things. Um, after that, we did chelation. Uh, we tried a few different chelations. We tried the natural one, which was a um, ash. It was a volcanic ash that was rich in minerals that we would do. And what it does is it dries the child out so it draws toxins out of their skin. And we saw mild results from that, but then we went to um, DMPS and we did that and we did it transdermally which means it's a cream that you rub on and boy, it stunk. <laughs> but we saw great results. In fact, the week after um, we started him on that, I think he was about four and a half. Uh, my wife took him to speech therapy. And when they got done with this, when they got done, they walked outside with the speech therapist and my son Justice looked at 
uh, his mother and said, mommy, I want to go down the curly slide. And his speech therapist is like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And we, you know, Jenny just started singing the praises of, of the chelation. Um, I know some people have had bad experiences, but again, it goes back to each child responds differently. But um, we should say, Mark, that you did all of this under the care of a physician, correct? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because these are not We've things for people to just do on yeah. their own. These are all things yeah. that have to be monitored. And, and usually child when, we would, yeah. when we would change physicians, they would try a new <clears throat> protocol. You know, but we were just like, what are we not going to do for our son? So, you know, some things, like I said, we threw a lot of money at some things that just didn't work. And it's unfortunate, but, you know, looking back, I don't have any regrets, um, you know, because of where my son is now. It all played a part. Well, and let's talk about where he is now. And so he's 15 years old, correct? He's, he's 18. 18 years old. Excuse me. Yep. I can't do my math. He's 18 <laughs> years old. And, and what is his life like now? Well, right now he is a senior in high school. We have him at a private school, so it's a little bit smaller school. He's doing great. He's got his full course load. Um, he doesn't get any help at all in the classroom. He is just there by himself. And um, he's got some friends. He's got limited friends. Uh, I'm gonna be honest. He's not playing any sports, although he's thinking about going out for golf next semester. Um, and, uh, you know, he loves his video games. Uh, he's a big Fortniter, uh, was a big, oh, what's the other one called? Uh, what's the one there? They build stuff. Minecraft. Minecraft. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Minecraft. So, uh, he was really into that and now he, uh, streams, he has his own YouTube channel. He's just amazing. He posts his own videos. Um, so he's really doing great. And what's his relationship like with his younger brother? <clears throat> oh, they fight like big brother, younger brother. It's like one of those things kids where, work. right, <laughs> it's one of those things where, you know, when they're fighting, you, you get on them and you're like, hey, you guys stop it. And then my wife and I look at each other and go, well, that's pretty typical. So that's good. Anytime yeah. you see that, you're like, that's good, <laughs> you know. And along the way, you and your wife, your wife got very involved in, in researching and knowing all these things, as did you. And, and along the way, you became advocates, too. Talk about how that happened and, and did that help you? Um, so I gotta, gotta back you up just a second sure. because Jenny was the one who did all the research. Okay. She. I was uh, trying to give you, slip you in some. a little credit I, there, Mark. I know, and, and I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, did, I did some, but I, I'm a people person, I, I talk. Okay. And so I'll go meet people and talk with them and, and see what works and, and find out information like that. But she's the one who spent the countless hours at night, and I know the moms out there listening know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, we both had our own ways of figuring out our little question mark. And um, so we, how that transferred into uh, uh, being an advocate is so many doctors would refer us, say, well, you know what? We would go in to see our primary physician um, who is this older gentleman and, and you'd be like, you know what? I just had three more kids come in who are autistic. Can I give the moms your number? And we would always say yes. Um, and, and we would go through the whole thing of this is what we did because when we first walked in and, and actually saw this doctor, he's the one who said formally as a doctor, yes, your son is autistic. And he was like, you know, here's a pamphlet. Uh, sorry about that. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> had no one to refer us to. He said, you can go to Children's Hospital and you know they can do some tests, but that was about it. And so we felt that void. And this was before you know uh, Autism Speaks was very big. This was before TACA was very big. Both of those organizations have great information now of first steps, what do you do? Yeah. Um, but we were just kind of left to figure it out. And I, I felt my heart just went out to those parents. Like your son is autistic, your daughter's autistic, now what? And so that's where our hearts really just went, well, how can we help people? You know, and it's tough because as you try to help people, some of them take your advice and some don't. Some just go, you know what, that's too hard. I'm not willing to do that. And you're just like, wow, we just have different mindsets, I guess. Yeah. Because I've always been whatever my son needs. What's their, what, like I said, what would I not do for my own son? Absolutely. And so you did get involved with Autism Speaks and, and started a good relationship with them. And you were also involved with TACA. 
you know, a lot of times I, w I watch families and the progression they make, and at some point, uh, families will choose to get involved with a group or an organization, and I watch what happens when they choose to do that and how much more confidence they have and, and how much richer their lives become. And I almost wish we could force people into joining a group, you know? Say, pick whichever group you want to join and be a part of it, but you're going you're gonna to get something out of it. Do you feel like that, that being involved with those groups helped you guys? Yes. Now, early on, we would go to some group things where it was just kind of families getting together, you know, to talk or, you know, autism dads or stuff like that. And we found some really bitter people. And, you know, you try and help them, but it, they would just turn negative. Now, what I've noticed with the bigger organizations, they kind of have it figured out now. So we started helping out first with Taka um, just because we were working with a physician or not a physician they were a caregiver um, when we started doing the tomato system and they referred us to taka and so we got involved with them and they gave us so much good information and we would go down to their uh, family picnics every year in orange county and what we really liked about it was a sense of community um, as you know shannon and as our our parents know autism can be very lonely because oh, yeah. you know 99 percent of the time you're at home with your child or probably a little less than 99, but so much of it, you're at home. And like this last weekend, I was out at Autism Speaks Walk Orange County and I actually helped MC uh, that event. And there was 8,000 people out there and it was all about celebrating. It was all about having fun. And you feel this community of, wow, I'm not alone because 90% of the time I feel like I'm all alone. Yeah. So that's where I feel like, yes, people should get involved. Just knowing there's other people who feel your struggle, who are there with you, who are willing to give you advice and you can give them advice. That kind of back and forth is so important. Yeah, I, th I think it really adds to everybody's experience. Now, you brought up Tomatis, so now you have to mm -hmm. explain to our audience what Tomatis is and tell us, did it help your son? So Tomatis really helped our son. And what it is, is it, it helped him to differentiate um, sounds. So when we, I, I always tell the story of, um, I did a wedding, I'm an ordained minister, so I do weddings. Um, and I did a wedding for one of my clients and we were, we went to the wedding and at the reception, my son Justice had both hands over his ears and he was under the table because he couldn't stand all the noise. And so we had to excuse ourselves early to go home. <clears throat> well, when we started him in Tomatis, what it is is they'll play um, like classical music through headphones like I'm wearing right now. And it'll be classical music and then they'll throw in a, a sound, just an odd sound here or there. And it's nothing sharp, but it starts training their brain to focus on what's important. And so the Tomatis protocol really helped my son. Again, I've talked to parents that have tried Tomatis and it didn't help. But for my son, it really helped him to be able to organize sound so that he could block out things that were just background and he could focus on things that are being said. And we saw him that with uh, an, an increase in magnesium that we added to his, uh, his supplement regimen um, really helped him to stop having to cover his ears because of sound. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of chelated magnesium um, mm. in, a, in anybody's diet. I, I think it's one of the greatest overlooked supplements. Um, but who was it that told you to go to Tomatis. Tomatis sent you to Taka, but who recommended Tomatis for you? Uh, that would be one of my wife's best friends in the world. Oh, now you're going to get me emotional. Uh. We have a friend, um, and her name is Amina, and she is just this wonderful woman who is just a step ahead of us in the autism thing. You know, she had a son. She had actually adopted um, her nephew, who was autistic, um, and, and took him on and then she and her husband had a son and he turned out to be autistic as well. Wow. And so she is my favorite Amina line is you've got to fight for your babies. Uh, <laughs> she was just a fighter and she gave my wife so much good information. And I believe it was Amina who told us about um, Tomatis. Uh, it was either that or, or um, um, one of the centers that we had down in Dublin, we went to Happy Talkers in Dublin. I think Charlene is still there to this day. Dublin, California is in Northern California. 
and uh, uh, it may have been Charlene that told us, but we met Amina through Charlene, so there you go. Well, and we're running out of time here, Mark, but I, I, I know you've talked about how you view this diff in a different way, and there are people watching right now who are in that place of lack, and you, you know because you have been there where they feel like, ugh, I had this plan for my child, and I had a plan for my life, and it just went away. And they don't understand when a parent who's further down the road who can say, I look at this now as a gift. And it's, it hurts for them to hear that because they say, this is not a gift. Yeah. And I always struggle with how to explain to them, I felt that way too, but you're going to get to a place. It's going to take a while. How do you explain to them uh, when you say that you look at this now as a gift? What can you say to them? You know, I look at, so one of the other things I do at my church is I help out with high school ministry. Um, I've been a youth group pastor before, and I've worked with a lot of high schoolers. And I look at my son now, and he's, he's typical in a lot of ways, and he's not in a lot of ways. Uh, but some of the things that he's not typical in, I am so thankful that he's not typical in. Yeah. He doesn't need to have the latest, greatest everything. He doesn't, you know, back talk me as much. We, we've gotten into some, you know, some verbal things, but I, I've learned how to deal with him in a way of, you know, when things escalate with him, I just come down lower and calming, and then he calms right down. You know, whereas I see parents with their teenagers, their, their um, you know, neurotypical teenagers and how they get into all these altercations and, you know, their kids are off doing drugs and all this. I don't have any of those issues. What I have is a young man I love to spend time with and I love to talk with. Amen to that. Hey, we can't forget that one of the reasons why we asked you on the show was because you had written a song. Uh, and we have, we want to show just a little bit of the song, not all of it. Can we have your permission to do that? Absolutely. Okay. And so what do you want to say to set it up before we show the video of that? Oh, well, I don't know what part of the song you're going to play and I don't okay. care, but, um, I wrote this song in one morning and this was when I was coming out of my depression. Uh, and, and I was bawling that morning when I wrote this song, I've written a number of songs, uh, I'm not some huge number, maybe 10. But this one I wrote so quickly and it's just straight from the heart. And I feel like every autistic parent or parent of an autistic child can relate to this. Okay. And, so, and, yeah, and people can find the whole song on YouTube, but where, where do mm -hmm. they need to look to find it? Uh, the best way to find it is to search it by saying a father's autism song. We're the okay. top one that comes up when you type in a father's autism song. And, and, we're and, and through this song, I say all the best therapies that I did. So it's a great okay. re recap for what we've talked about. We're only going to play 45 seconds of it, and then we're going to come back. But I want you guys to get a taste of this and how talented this dad is. So Gabe, go ahead and show them this video. Seems like only yesterday We were living so carelessly What a beautiful baby What a beautiful family What does the future hold? Well, it's so bright and so clear Nothing could be better Oh, we've got nothing to fear Baby, can you hear me? Why won't you look into my eyes? Tell me how you feel inside. Please don't run and hide. Then the bottom dropped out. Well, we lost the sound, uh, but you can already see how emotional. We want you to go, and the point is we want you to go and watch it on YouTube. Uh, we don't want we don't want the views from it here. We want you to give those views to Mark, um, but you can see that it's a very emotional uh, song from a dad to his son, 
and it, uh, the, it tells the story. The story unfolds. You may have already seen it, but it's worth watching again. So again, tell them what to search so they can find it, Mark. You type in a father's autism song. Okay, a father's yeah. autism song. We just think that your story is amazing, and we're so happy for you uh, and for everything that you guys have been able to accomplish. And I'm so glad that you were able to come here and share this because I know that there are some moms who are watching who their husbands have not, have, are, that are still in that depression phase. And I want them yeah. to see that you can be in that phase and end up where you are. That yeah. can still happen and that it takes time. And I want for the dads to see how amazing it, it, it can be when they get involved. Because honestly, when dads get involved, it's a really special thing. So we really want to thank you for everything that you do, Mark, and uh, wish you guys the best of happy holidays. Thanks. Can I share one last thing? Yes, absolutely. So something to look for on World Autism Day this year, um, I've been in talks with uh, Autism Speaks because my son Justice came up with the idea of lighting up Minecraft blue. So we're gonna do a Light It Up Blue event online that will stream where people can buy skin packs um, and the money goes to Autism Speaks and it'll be a way of unifying our community online. What a wonderful thing. So that's not, that's not sealed yet, but we're starting the talks. Let's so, put it out into it the goes. universe. I think that can and should happen. I think that's wonderful. I can't wait to see that. That'll look really cool. Well, yeah. congratulations to you and to your son on that. And uh, again, thank you for everything that you do. Happy holidays. You too. Thanks, Bye -bye. Shannon. Um, so what an amazing dad. Uh, what an amazing story. And... Uh, so thrilled that we had an opportunity to talk with him. We've been uh, trying to connect with him for a while and uh, our spam filter stuff wasn't getting to him. So, so thrilled. He was so willing to, to be on the show. We're really thrilled about that. All right. So uh, I got to talk a little bit for a second here about uh, we've only got two shows left to the end of the year. I can't even believe how quickly we're getting to the end of the year. But um, there's a lot of stuff that we have to cover next week. And don't forget that Dr. Dorian Grandbichet is back next Wednesday to answer your questions. I know so many of you have written in questions and you've been waiting patiently. She is back for one of the last two shows, so we're really excited about that. Plus, we've got a, a really wonderful cavalcade of fabulous people to end out our final week of the year. Uh, when we come back in the new year, there's, you're going to start to see some things that are going to change. We are going to be off on hiatus for a couple of weeks. Um, we're welcoming some new people to our staff. We are so saddened uh, to say goodbye to Samantha. We've had the fabulous Gabe filling in for us. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, we have loved Samantha so much, but we're wishing her the very best as she continues on a new journey we are thanking all the people that have filled in um, as we said goodbye to Samantha. Gabe has been here doing the heavy lifting more often than not. And so we're going to say goodbye to him. We have a new person that we're going to introduce you guys to in the new year. And the schedule might change a little bit. i got to be honest. We're looking at some changes as we move forward with our new website. But all of it is to bring you more content on a more consistent basis in the places that you want to see it and to keep it free. Uh, we're trying to do that. I want to encourage you, as, as we've been making this transition with staff, we've been a little bit slow in posting things because we have been understaffed uh, for a while now. And so I, I, I'm putting out a plea to anybody who's watching, share a video. Share a video on your Facebook site. We are this close to getting to our three millionth view on YouTube. Uh, we would really love to hit that before January 1st, but I need some help in order for us to get that. So please share a video. Pick one that you like. Heaven knows we've got thousands of them. Pick one that you like and share it on uh, your social media. Help us to get to that three millionth view. 
But we will be back next week with more to talk about. Don't forget, don't cancel therapy. Do it with a therapist, right? Happy holidays. And again, uh, we'll be back on Wednesday. Until then, uh, please give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.